Hello and welcome to GCV Analytics webinar. Today we're going to be talking about the consumer sector and we are very pleased to have as a guest speaker Maisie Devine from uh, Anheuser-Busch in Beth. Uh, Maisie has, uh, has been uh, running the sustainability investments and accelerator at uh, AB uh, in Beth. Um, she is also a guest columnist at uh, Inc. Magazine and an entrepreneur herself. Uh, she is uh, a co-founder co of uh, the passive recruiting uh, app Savvy, uh, which uh, allows companies to discreetly recruit talent. And very interestingly, uh, Maisie uh, uh, has a kind of a kind of an unusual background for someone working uh, in corporate venturing. She studied art and archaeology at Princeton University. So uh, welcome, Maisie. Uh, it's a true pleasure to have you here on our webinar. Thanks so much for having me here. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening uh, to everyone on the call, depending on where you are. But very happy to be here and excited to dive into the content. Likewise, um, before before we uh, dig into the consumer sector and to the nitty gritty of that, um, I'm going to give the word to our uh, founder and editor in chief, uh, Jim Mawson, for a few uh, introductory remarks and a brief data overview on uh, Q1. Jim. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Kalyan. I really appreciate uh, you setting this up and obviously honoured and delighted you could join us again, Maisie. It was fascinating to hear you speak on stage at the GCBI Summit back in Monterey in California in January. And so it's great that you can join us once again to share some more of the insights, not just on the consumer sector, but more broadly what's happening in what I think is quite an exciting area around the impact investment space. We're planning to launch our sort of next title, Global Impact Venturing, after our London Symposium at the end of May, 22nd and 23rd of May in London. Um, and that will join our existing titles, looking at obviously global corporate venturing and global university venturing and understanding how corporations and universities are supporting the startups, either directly or indirectly. That complements the work we've been doing with the GCV Academy, the training facility, so that the next generation of corporate ventures can come through. And obviously, callie has been leading the GCV Analytics, the database, and they're all part of what we call the Global Corporate Venture and Leadership Society. What we found when you look through the data is that the top 20% of corporate ventures do about 80% of the deals. They're the ones that are really flying the flag for the community, understanding how best to help and support the entrepreneurs and work collaboratively, co collaboratively with the other VCs and other syndicate members. So, as I mentioned, uh, we've run the sort of GCVI Summit and the GCV Symposium. The other events that we've been planning through the year will be in New York, uh, Brazil, Japan, and a host of other countries. Next slide, Kalia. And that will fit with uh, uh, a sort of the events we've been doing much more sort of locally and regionally, either in specific sectors, such as in Houston around the oil and gas, sector or in specific countries or regions such as Israel. We're also developing the GCB Connect uh, community programs so that corporations in specific regions such as Chicago on the 24th next week uh, or in Switzerland and Germany in Berlin at the end of June. Next slide please. And obviously the, the big one that we got coming up after the, the summit at the end of January is the London Symposium, which will be 22nd, 23rd. We get about 400 or so CBCs. That's about two and a half trillion dollars of aggregate annual revenue from the corporation to attend. And we're honoured that the government's invited us in uh, to the House of Commons for the GCV Powerless drinks on the 23rd. Thanks. Next slide. So uh, obviously, for those interested in GCB Analytics, we're delighted that Cubix Analytics, our software providers in California, been helping develop the platform on the understand the data. And to learn more about GCB and the Leadership Society, don't hesitate to get in touch. Next slide. So as Kelly, I mentioned, well, just before we touch into the consumer sector, we've obviously been looking at the Q1 data. Uh, that was out in the April issue of Global Corporate Venturing out last week. But just a quick sense is that, you know, actually it was a very strong quarter. And one of the things that I found quite interesting was that, you know, the overall venture ecosystem had broadly a flat or down Q1. Uh, but for corporations involved in deals, they've actually been doing more deals. Next slide. 
And in, when you look at the sort of uh, at the deal count, the sort of valuation of those deals was slightly down, uh, but the number of them was actually a record uh, at 789. And I'll just bring you in here, Maisie. You know, how does that see from where you sit in terms of the ground floor? Um, you know, what are you finding in terms of activity among some of your corporate or venture peers? And what are the entrepreneurs feeling? Is there still a lot of enthusiasm to set up companies? Yeah, so in terms of the deal flow, we're, we're still seeing really strong deal flow coming across our desks and um, entrepreneurs raising money, even starting at late seed uh, series A through C, really good companies, a lot of uh, traction that these entrepreneurs are getting. But I think what is concerning me in terms of flow is that if the, the venture community is slowing down in terms of money that they're putting in early stage, so um, pre-seed, early seed, we're going to start seeing, you know, less less deals, fewer deals um, coming through uh, because those entrepreneurs just don't have the money to start up their businesses um, to a stage where we would come in from a corporate side. So while we're still seeing uh, really strong strong companies and strong flow right now, the the you know when you when you lose that early stage capital, um, it really hurts when you can come in from the corporate side hurts because we don't come in until you see significant traction um, mm. and ability to really plug into our ecosystem. And so that's the the one concern that I had in seeing some of this data from, from Q1. Mm, that's great. Thanks very much. Kelly, on next slide. Uh, I think one of the things that we've, um, you know, I think gives us a little bit of confidence as well is the fact that um, you know, broadly, there's two areas, I think, which is why corporations continue to sort of invest, even if the, sort of the general VCs have slowed down a little bit, is one is the sort of the amount of money coming back you know, through exits, you know, remains actually pretty strong in Q1. Um, you know, it was a, you know, nearly 15 billion in terms of returns. There were some pretty big exits in, you know, Middle East and Kareem, obviously the IPO for Lyft. You know, and some other big, you know, unicorn type exits, and Vito and Vigo. Um, you know, so I think that sort of that gives a bit of confidence that the model has worked for those that have been doing corporate venturing. And next slide for a number of years that you know actually they can find the deals that can deliver the exits, they can then provide the money back and and then continue to support. And then the second area, which I think we still continue to find interesting, is the fact that there's a number of corporations still doing their first deals quarter by quarter is actually you know still record high if you think last year since the beginning of q1 2018 you know there's at least a hundred corporations investing new i.e these are their first deals in each of those quarters and i think the fact that you know as i go back at the start that sort of top 20 percent of firms have been doing 80 percent of deals they've been leaders they've had a a practice what we're finding is that the new generation those corporations that are still coming in that maybe were set up a couple of years ago and started doing activity last year once they got a team in place and strategy in place you know i think they're being set up much more designed to be you know long term and put in place a, a sort of funding mechanism that can support them so i think that's a a degree of hope that even if some of the you know the overall venture industry isn't necessarily growing in terms of lots of new debut funds for VC managers, the number of corporations coming in is still, you know, robust, and that kind of indicates as long as you know there's not a, a seismic shock from an economic downturn that wipes a lot of them out, that actually they can then, you know, in, in many ways provide, you know, a little bit more robustness. I remember yeah, a couple I, of years. I, I would just add on that that back at the conference um, in California, about half of the people that came up to me after I spoke were other corporates who were just starting to set up their funds. So uh, Chick-fil-A, British Tobacco, Gore, at, at, at least 50% of the people were starting their own funds, um, had never done any sort of corporate venture before, but were just getting into the game. And I think the other good thing is learning from corporates who have been doing this for some time or who you know have seen, you know, great progress and, and have had also learnings that they can implement in and so they're coming in with a lot more 
background perspective for, from their peers uh, and learning as they set it up. So coming in, not, not new as we did, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, but really with the perspective of, of their peers and other corporate partners, which hopefully should lead into being, um, you know, aggressive in their investments and, um, you know, with a lot more confidence than they would have been without that background. Mm, yeah, I think that's a great point, actually, Maisie. And, you know, and I think just that sort of the experienced cohort, the people like yourselves, um, you know, have been doing it for a few years. You know, what we find, particularly with a number of new groups, is that, that you know, they're taking it seriously. They're, you know, they're going through the training courses or doing the academies. You know, they're trying to get the information and, you know, talk to people like yourself real thought leaders in the community to to understand how to approach it and also think about i think you know thoughtfully about how to develop a team you know how to get a, a senior leaders you know within the corporation maybe bring some people who understand the vc model or the entrepreneurs as well as those who perhaps have some experience from a corporate venturing background like bat you mentioned british american tobacco you know Phil Geisler, you know, used to run Unilever Ventures. So, you know, having having that degree of sort of track record themselves, they know a few of the scars, they can perhaps move a bit quickly. But next slide, please, Kelly, and I think we'll move on to the consumer sector. Yeah, um, so uh, thanks, thanks for the overview, uh, Jim. Uh, before I move on, I would just like to remind uh, the people who are on the call and on this session that they should feel free to submit their questions on the little box appearing on the right hand side of their of their screens. And um, towards the end of this session, uh, Jim, Maisie and I uh, will try to answer uh, whatever whatever questions uh, questions you uh, you guys may have uh, now on to on to the consumer sector um, before before I delve into into the data into some of the trends uh, I uh, I would like to uh, just mention uh, how we define consumer sector in our magazine um, the way we've defined it uh, it encompasses uh, things like e-commerce platforms and uh, e-retail broadly speaking then food and beverages and related technologies and services, um, including including food delivery that also goes in goes in here, um, fashion and apparel, um, then the uh, wellness uh, sector uh, broadly speaking, including things like hygiene, beauty and fitness, uh, some consumer electronics, uh, physical consumer products uh, such as furniture, for example, and other consumer tech uh, and and applications. Uh, when we speak about this sector, um, very broadly and very generally, uh, we see that technological advancements uh, have gone hand in hand with a quest for consumer centricity. And those have been uh, the broad defining characteristics of the sector. Uh, technological disruption and uh, more focus on, on consumers and on the customer. Um, on the demand side per se, there have been pressures on, well, in terms of the contents of products and the packaging. And uh, on the supply side, uh, there's been uh, disruption in terms of the di digitization of, uh, of commerce and retail. And uh, by that, uh, I don't mean only on the B2C side, but also on the B2B side, um, because digitization is already a must in, uh, for most consumer brands uh, in terms of uh, digitalizing their supply chain networks, making them uh, more efficient and streamlining them overall. Also production lines uh, being moved much closer to consumers. So that's uh, that's definitely a big disruptive factor. Um, the, the one space within the consumer sector that's seen much growth uh, in recent times, and uh, our data shows that as, as you will see on some of the following slides, is uh, food and beverages. Um, so there has been definitely demand for healthier foods and personalized nutrition, alternative proteins with the rise of um, vegan, vegan diet and the popularity of it, for example, um, shortening supply chains, reducing wasted calories by addressing a new food production and food waste. So uh, Maisie, I'd like to um, really, really uh have your your view and your your expertise on the matter as an active investor and practitioner on these questions uh what what, what is your take on these trends in particular in the food and beverages space and 
in the broader trends that I've already already mentioned and uh, and enumerated. Yeah, so I think that uh, the best way to see this illustrated is to think about walking down the dairy aisle over the last five years, at least in New York City, and how it has completely changed. Um, it's been basically overhauled. You used to see a couple yogurts or milks that were uh, non-dairy, and now it's almost half the aisle with almond milk, soy milk, cashew, yogurt. Um, you're, you're definitely seeing those trends um, and the consumer pull uh, really overhauling that aisle. We are looking at um, you know, playing in that space as well. So uh, one of the co-products from beer making is uh, it's called Spent Grain. Um, and right now we use that for primarily for animal feed. But what we've been looking at recently is how can we um, convert that into a, a human grade product and something that can be an alternative protein or fiber um, that can go in some of these products. And, and barley is actually a really strong um, grain, uh, ancient grain. And so we have made some investments in companies that are specializing in converting that spent grain into protein isolate that can go into some of these foods that you're seeing, like the Impossible Burger or Beyond Meat um, and, and any of these other uh, products that are looking for a different type of plant-based protein um, that where pea protein or soy is not a good fit or has the wrong taste profile or doesn't have the right attributes. Um, so it's something that we are looking at um, very intensely. I think the, the demand is there, it's growing. Um, you see that in, in even just the different available options that, that you have going uh -huh. into some of these markets and, and retail spaces. So it's something that certainly there is a, a huge trend there. Um, a lot of the corporate partners, not just AB and Bev, but Nestle and Mars are, are definitely looking to play in this space and it's going to be growing significantly. Um, and it's not just about, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the plant-based protein, the vegan, um, but it's also looking at sustainability. How do we make sure that we're um, upcycling our waste, that we're reducing what goes into landfills, et cetera. So, um, it's, it's a huge trend and, and corporates are playing a really big role in that and looking at it very closely. Yeah, um, you and your you and your team are very um, very focused on uh, sustainability issues. Would you like to share with us a bit more on some of the challenges uh, that um, you see emerging businesses, emerging startups uh, trying to uh, trying to address in in that in that uh, in that space? I think that packaging is, is a really tough problem for small companies coming into this space. Um, how can they integrate sustainable packaging in a cost-effective way? It's, always, uh, it, it, it's sometimes much easier to get, you know, non-PET plastic and, and put that into your supply chain. It's cheap and, and easy to start. Um, so I think that getting sustainable packaging um, integrated into your supply chain early as a small company is a huge mm -hmm. challenge um, and something that we're watching, you know, and even for big companies, it's, it's a huge problem, increasing recycled content, um, getting rid of unnecessary plastic, you know, converting to PET. So I think for, for small companies, that is, is a challenge. Um, and, you know, for, for companies of all sizes, really, but particularly for small companies that don't you know, that need even easy to start, um, packaging is going to be certainly a challenge. Mm -hmm. I see. And any any impression that you have on the more general trends in the sector in terms of customer centricity? Um, any, any sort of uh, impression on um, some sort of a digital engagement with customers that uh, the emerging brands you've been working with uh, are doing um, some some something unusual or something um, something innovative in that in that uh, space. I certainly think that transparency is a, something that consumers are starting to increasingly demand, um, mm -hmm. and you see that reflected even in the most recent Bud Light marketing initiatives around putting ingredients on the packaging for 
you know, I think you're seeing a lot more um, uh, recycling icons on packaging. You're seeing fair trade called out. You're seeing, um, you know, one percent donated to to charity. All of right. this is reflected, I think, on packaging. Um, and you're seeing it much more, you know, more and more consumers are demanding that their the companies that they um, purchase from and the products that they they consume are doing business in a sustainable way. And they're turning away from alternatives that aren't making uh, that conversion and aren't prioritizing it. So, um, you know, you see it with Bud Light, you're going to see it with emerging brands as well. They, right. they understand the consumer demand and they're trying to respond. Right, right. Um, well, this is a rather encouraging, rather encouraging trend uh, as consumers are becoming ever more um, conscious and, and, and aware of uh, sustainability issues uh, in terms of production of consumer consumer goods. Um, and in terms of uh, in terms of consumers, um, what we what we have been seeing and what forecasts have been telling us is that uh, there are going to be one. 0.4 billion new members of the global middle class by 2020, which is not, which is not even that far, that far away if we think about it. And uh, you know, these new members of the global middle class um, will have uh, generally higher disposable disposable income, uh, which they they would like to spend. So there are certainly opportunities opportunities uh, for for consumer goods and consumer brands on on a global scale and uh, a lot of them uh, are actually uh, coming uh, from from east asia and um, from uh, from sort of like the apac region um and uh, we have seen that uh you know at the same time, e-commerce uh, has been uh, has been very very disruptive. In fairly recent times, um, in the last quarter of 2018, uh, we saw what some people in the media use the buzzword retail apocalypse, as um, traditional brick and mortar retails like Macy's, J.C. Penney, Nordstrom, and Co. Um, basically reported very very low profits. Uh, from that uh, holiday season, and uh, at the same time, uh, there have been uh, some some uh, some consumer brands like the denim producer uh, Diesel that uh, went bankrupt. Um, so there's definitely been been a, a sizable and uh, notable disruption in the retail space. Uh, even though even though e-commerce uh, technically, according to any government statistic, you might you might look at uh, still uh, constitutes uh, a fairly limited limited proportion of, of all commerce. Uh, its uh, its impact is is being very significant and very deeply felt in in recent times. And um, part of it may have to do with uh, with what some analysts have dubbed uh, shift to value among consumers in developed markets. Uh, in other words, uh, the tendency of consumers in developed markets to uh, save a buck, really, um, picking store brands instead of uh, instead of established brand names for uh, their fast-moving consumer goods, um, and you know this this trend has been somewhat present since the since the global financial crisis onward, even though we're still right now in the expansionary phase as you might you might argue but i but i suppose the uh, the shocks on stock exchanges around the world last year probably had something to do with uh, with people becoming a bit more thrifty as a as an immediate result of that um, and just being being a bit more uh, a bit more circumspect on how much uh, how much they spend um, Along with that, um, you know, we've seen we've seen a trend of brand erosion in the fast-moving consumer goods segment. Uh, as millennials are seem to be less likely to purchase big brands uh, today, uh, there's a there's been a clear shift of focus on small brands and small challenger brands uh, often tend to be positioned as premium. Um, um, when when we talk about small brands and premium and think of think of beers, it's really uh, craft 
craft beers that come to mind, uh, Maisie. And I, I'd like to uh, I'd like to know a, a bit more on what's going on in in that particular space. Uh, has there has has there been this sort of disruption? Is it sustainable? Uh, will there be a correction and that kind of thing? So, <clears throat> it, it, actually, there was a really interesting article that just came out last night that was covering this in the last. Uh, you know, eight to 10 years, clearly craft has been in an enormous growth trajectory, especially in the United States. And we're now at the most number of craft breweries that we've ever had in this country, um, you know, over 7,000 craft brands. Um, but what we're starting to see is, is oh. a correction. Um, and, you know, you're, you're seeing it with some of the brands, big craft brands that you know, like Blue Moon, um, Sierra Nevada, let's see, what were some of the other ones? Sam Adams are Sam all, Adams. yeah, Sam Adams were, are seeing a contraction, particularly in the last quarter. Um, and so while there was a huge you know, growth trajectory for craft, I think we're, we've hit the inflection point, um, the saturation point where we're going to start seeing um, certainly a, a contraction, a correction, um, and we're going to start seeing some of those those craft brands, those 7,000, not all of them are going to make it. We're going to see them folding. Um, and I think you'll, you're going to end up with the, the best brands will continue um, to grow and, and to gain share, um, take share from the ones that are folding. So we're going to continue to see, I think, strong tr trends in craft and, and strong brands being continue to be built, but there won't be as many. Um, and I, you know, I think that the correction is starting to happen right now, and we're seeing it reflected in the last quarter with, with some of the most known craft brands, even. Um, Interesting. And, and, that, and that just came out, so uh, news news in the industry within the last 24 hours or so. I see. That's that's great. Um... I, I I find that very interesting because um, before working for GCBI, I, I was actually um, working on consumer research, and uh, I happen to know a, a very peculiar thing about beer brands is uh, is that around the world, um, whenever whenever you you look at a particular country or a particular market defined as a country, it's normally it's normally a local brand uh, that is the predominant and the most sold one. And you mentioned that in the United States, there are clearly over 7000 craft brands. So that's uh, I don't know. I don't know that that's like probably a hundred over a hundred per, per state on average. Right. <laughs> or something like that. Um, so is that is there is there some sort of uh, a local local preference effect for those craft brands that, that that you've been seeing or is that is that just for the big and established sort of incumbent brands yeah in the united states there's certainly there's there's been a shift to local people like going to the local tap rooms there's been you know huge growth in breweries selling right out of their tap rooms um, mm -hmm. and, and supporting local business, that's certainly something that we're seeing and, and has been a trend. But, you know, internationally, the, the, the big brands are, are seeing, continuing to see really strong growth, particularly, I think, in APAC in China. Um, mm -hmm. Big brands, you know, the brands that we have there are growing, growing significantly. Um, and there is this, I think, thirst for... Um, international imports and 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 strong brands from from other countries like corona from mexico or budweiser from from the us um so you have in the united states certainly an, an interest in in local um but internationally you're seeing a, a a trend and and strong growth in in large import brands i see that's very very interesting um, and it seems like uh, it seems like small brands uh, have um, have had a have got kind of a breakthrough in in other in other sub subsectors of uh, of the consumer consumer industry, uh, such as in the wellness and health and beauty subsector. Um, in cosmetics, uh, small challenger brands uh, already uh, reportedly represent. Uh, 10% of the market and are growing four times faster than the rest. And uh, 
curiously enough, this has been driven by digital uh, digital content, which was generated uh, by users on platforms like YouTube uh, or other uh, discussion forums and that sort of thing. Uh, so this is uh, this this just sort of comes to highlight. Uh, the importance of uh, digitally engaging customers and uh, goes back to the major point of uh, customer centricity. And I guess uh, a better, uh, no better illustra illustration of this uh, is what uh, was or came from the uh, fashion and apparel sector uh, a couple of months ago uh, when, um, you know, there was a bit of a controversy around uh, the comments of the chief marketing officer of Victoria's Secret. Um, and as a result of that, the CEO of, of the company had to had to resign. So, um, you know, the, the comments were certainly controversial and they certainly did estrange and could be considered offended by uh, by a very, very significant, significant groups uh, in terms of population uh, and all uh, in the United States. So, 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 you know, that, that controversy sort of highlighted the importance of uh, digitally engaging consumers, uh, consumers the proper, the proper way um, indeed. Um, now let's, uh, let's move on to, uh, to the data. Uh, there were 324 deals um, in, in in startup companies uh, that were backed by consumer corporates between uh, March last year and February this year, which we tracked, and uh, the three major geographies uh, that we uh, we saw them in were the United States, uh, 112 deals, uh, China, 69, and uh, India, 33. China and India being uh, very significant emerging geographies for the consumer sector and for consumers in general. So uh, Macy, I'd like to ask you, uh, because you guys do invest uh, also internationally, not just within the US, uh, what have been what have been your investments outside of the US and uh, what are the kind of things that you that you observe uh, in the consumer space and in the beer space in particular um, in other in other geographies? Sure. So um, outside of the U.S., we've done a couple of deals in Europe, um, in Brazil, uh, mm -hmm. which is a big market for us. Um, we in the in the accelerator program right now, we have two Chinese companies, um, two Indian companies as well. Um, so and, and we do do yeah, a bit more in South America. We were in uh, have been investors in Rappi. Um, which is a Colombian company originally, um, but now they've expanded to, I think, six or seven countries in, in South America. Um, mm. So we are comfortable in kind of Latin America, South America, and, and Europe and, and Asia. Um, those are kind of the sweet spots, um, in addition to the United States. <clears throat> but I think mm. for we, as a company, you know, Brazil's had a, a couple of tough years, but it's starting to see good growth there and a, a nicely developing startup scene. A, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, we have three companies um, from Brazil in our current cohort in the accelerator, in the sustainability accelerator. Um, so, cons and, and, and we have a local program there that's been doing really well and, and getting the company. So, um, we're, we're starting to see strong growth coming back in Brazil. Um, yeah, China, I was in China last week actually, um, and it it they're really really pushing um, some really good companies there. Uh, our two companies that we have in the accelerated now are energy focused. Um, so looking at renewable energy, it's something that uh, Xi Jinping has made a top priority for the country. So seeing a lot in the energy space. Uh, on sustainability, um, but the country as a whole is really pushing startups in an entrepreneurial um, lens. So I think you'll continue to see a lot of activity out of China and plus it's growing nicely. Um, India, I think the one thing is that it continues to be a little bit hard in terms of market entrance. Um, 
can be tough. I think there's a lot of red tape. Um, it's, it, I think it's just historically been somewhat tough to do business there. Um, but I think there's a lot of strong growth opportunities. It's a really talented market. Um, so we have to find a way to, to engage there, even though it might be a little more difficult than other geographies. There's so much opportunity in India, despite it being a tough market to get into. Um, and then for Europe, we, we, there's a lot of strong, strong companies there, strong growth. And some of the, the European presidents have made it a priority, you know, technology and startups. Macron, certainly when he came into office, made it a top priority and specifically on the sustainability side. So we're seeing a lot there as well. Um, and we've made some, some investments in that space. And we have some companies in the cohort right now on uh, water um, and then uh, agriculture technology. Uh, is a growing sector um, right now, and we've, we're making some, we're doing some pilots in that space, and we're making some investments as well. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it, it seems like you guys have made inroads in uh, in every major geography. So uh, thank you very much for sharing these observations on um, all the major uh, major innovation geographies of the world where you guys have uh, where you guys are involved in. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to continue with uh, with the uh, with the presentation. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the invest investments that uh, these consumer consumer corporates uh, did, uh, we saw that they invested mostly in um, in consumer enterprises and consumer startups. So uh, those were, like I mentioned, mostly uh, food and beverage, e-commerce, uh, as well as fashion and apparel. Um, but there were also investments in in other in other areas um, that were that are either contingent or in some way synergistic with the consumer sector. So um, in services, we saw a lot of a lot of deals in accommodation and travel, tech, um, a lot a lot of investments in supply chains and logistics. Quite quite logically and quite closely, uh, some in HR tech as well. Um, in terms of IT startups, uh, what was most interesting was uh, AI and big data as well as enterprise software to consumer corporates. Uh, and from the financial sector, quite expectedly, payment tech and, uh, and insurance tech, as well as some, some, alternative, uh, some alternative lending in in, um, in in emerging emerging markets, um, so so basically quite a few uh, quite a few uh, investments in uh, in quite a few quite a few different areas. And the following the following network diagram actually uh, tries to summarize some of the biggest co investments of consumer corporates uh, here. So as as you can see that there is there is kind of a heavy focus on uh, food and beverage uh, we we see microtechnology uh, that got backed by Tyson and Kellogg's and uh, CGC uh, then evolve biosystems shaft um but 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 also other also other other areas like e-commerce for example we had uh, flipkart where eBay and Walmart co-invested and eventually um one of them acquired Flipkart, which is uh, the biggest, uh, well, basically the Indian Amazon, so to speak, um, and then um, and, th and then of course some investments in uh, in the ride hailing uh, space, such as Gojek. Uh, this is, I, I, I believe, this this trend is largely because uh, some of the ride hailing startups and ride hailing players, um, whether globally like Uber or uh, locally like Gojek, are are also um, delving into the food delivery space. So um, as long as they're doing that, as long as uh, that's of interest to them, uh, I think uh, synergies are going to be there, and the interest uh, is not going to dissipate there. Um, if we look at the investments of consumer corporates uh, on a year by you know, year by year basis, uh, we see that uh, they they went up quite significantly from 2017 to 2018. Uh, going up from 
200, 215 rounds in, uh, in 2017, all the way to 330 last year. And also in terms of total dollars in those rounds, and I, I would like to mention these are total dollars. These are not dollars invested by corporates only. So going up from seven, 17 billion uh, to just north of 44 billion. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's quite a significant growth on a year year on year basis uh, globally and um, for the first two months of 2019 uh, we saw 44 uh, 45 deals excuse me worth uh, 3.3 3.4 uh, billion billion dollars um, and so uh, the top investors among those corporates uh, happen to be um, for the year that we're looking at uh, happen to be all from the e-commerce space uh, um, the China-based Alibaba, U.S.-based Amazon, uh, which has gone fairly fairly global, and uh, also the Japan-based Rakuten. Um, we, we also see uh, names like JD.com, which is also a play, big player in the uh, e-commerce uh, and e-retail space. Um, so uh, those have been the dominant in terms of number of uh, sheer number of, of deals that uh, they have been doing. Um, and in terms of top corporate investors, consumer and from other sectors that have committed to uh, startups from the consumer sector, we see uh, Alibaba, but also players like SoftBank, which invests through its uh, gargantuan vision fund, um, as well as uh, internet companies, internet companies like Tencent, even um, even media companies uh, such as Comcast and uh, and financial uh, companies like Goldman Sachs uh, also investing investing in the sector quite a bit. Um, in terms of the total dollars, uh, the top one is uh, Altria Altria Group because of uh, actually the top deal for the past uh, year, which I'm going to discuss uh, discuss on a, on a slide a little a little further down. Um, that's uh, that's a tobacco company. It's and it's an interesting uh, quite an interesting deal. Um, in terms of um, in terms of how um, consumer startups have uh, evolved in numbers uh, in numbers of their corporate backed rounds, uh, this this di this uh, this diagram uh, well, well excuse me this uh, this graph uh, shows that and uh, there seems to be there seems to be quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of growth from uh, 2017 to 2018 not so much in terms of the sheer number of rounds although there is certainly uh, certainly growth there up from tw uh, 227 to 260 uh, but more so in terms of the total dollars uh, from 5. Uh, 5.8 billion to uh, up to 40.2 billion uh, so this suggests quite a few uh, rising valuations. And I, I'd like to uh, get Macy's feedback here. Um, is rising valuation something that, that you have encountered uh, in over the past year, year and a half? And uh, how, what, what are your observations on that? We had some companies um, that we have looked at that had pretty high valuations. Um, I think that it tends to uh, scare corporates a little bit when the valuations are are pumped up in that way um, because we're used to certain multiples for our for our deals at least in the beverage sector and when it's way outside of um, you know the norm we get skittish um, mm -hmm. so more often than not when the valuations are are, are, as, are as high as we saw in the past year, we start to pass on opportunities, um, mostly because we're looking to have a certain, um, you know, a certain equity holding. And if the valuation is too high, we're just, it's, it's too expensive, uh, mm -hmm. frankly, but we'll end up passing. Um, so we did see some of those deals come across the desks last year and, and we ended up passing just because, you know, we're used to a multiple that we are right. comfortable with and, and it's proven and anything outside of that standard deviation, um, we, we end up passing on. So hmm. you, you may have them, but I think that in general, the corporates are going to be uh, less, 
you're going to see a drop in participation because it's it's really outside of of their norm. Mm -hmm. Right, and and when we when we talk about um, rising valuations, inevitably inevitably what uh, what tends to come up uh, in a conversation is uh, is that is that foreshadowing uh, a correction? Is that foreshadowing um, um, a falling off the cliff kind of thing uh, that may happen within the next, say, six months to to a year? Is the, is that something that that you are preparing for? Is that something uh, that um, you are considering as an investor? Yeah, I mean, it's always something when you're seeing those types of signals. It's it's always a possibility. Um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, you would hope that that's not the case, um, but we, you know, I think we're in a position that you know we could take advantage of of deals if, if that happens. If if you start seeing the money dry up significantly, um, and there's a correction, I think there's a lot of really amazing companies out there right now that. Um, could get picked up, you know, consumer startups that could get picked up quickly if if they start mm -hmm. coming cheap. Um, so that that might be something that you see coming in the next six to twelve months if this trend continues. I see, I see. So uh, there's so you envision plenty of opportunities to um, buy low and eventually sell sell high at some point in the future. After that, that's 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 good. Yeah. And we're growing within our business um, to to make significant impact on, um, on the sector. You know, mm -hmm. if, it, if it's growing nicely and we're able to pick it up inexpensively while it's still in a, a growth trajectory and make investments to, to build out the supply chain and distribution network, then I think it would be really interesting for, for many different consumer mm -hmm. uh, entities. Sure. Sure. Um, so as this uh, as this graph illustrates, um, it's uh, it's mostly growth that we've seen uh, in the food and beverage space, along with uh, e-commerce, e-retail, and uh, and fashion. These were the top the top subsectors uh, within the broader consumer space, as we define it. Um, also, we've seen we've seen some growth in the hygiene and beauty or the wellness uh, wellness sector over the past over the past four years and uh, for the most part until there is uh, there is a significant correction uh, as may as uh, Maisie uh, mentioned uh, we we expect uh, to see the proportion of deals uh, staying more or less more or less the same uh, within uh, within what happens to be the deal flow for for a year uh, in the consumer in the consumer sector um and uh if uh, if we are to look at the co-investments in consumer consumer startups um uh, again we see we see um quite a few quite a few from the food and beverage space we see miss fresh uh, zamato microtechnology swiggy which is a food delivery uh business uh, based in india um, the, the, there are some in the wellness space, like Peloton Psycho, um, the physical consumer goods like Beta, which was backed by Macy's, um, and, and, and some other. But there's definitely there's definitely been uh, been kind of a boom for the food and beverage food and beverage space, attracting a variety of a variety of investors, not co corporate investors, not just from the uh, consumer sector, but from other sectors as well as as this illustrates. Um, in terms of the in terms of the top deals, uh, I just want to go uh, over some of them uh, very briefly. Uh, the top one by far was uh, Jewel Labs, uh, and it was a stake purchase deal in which um, Altria Group. Uh, Purchased it a 35% stake for 12.8 billion dollars. Now uh, this is th this is huge by any measure, uh, but even more so in the uh, tobacco venturing space, um, because we have a we quite frankly have a particular challenge in uh, in tracking tobacco uh, 
the tobacco corporate venturing uh, deals because, uh, well, quite frankly, tobacco companies are not um, particularly vociferous about the deals, uh, the deals that they're doing and what they invest in. Um, so, from a space where where we we barely get to hear about any deals done by Altria or British American Tobacco or Imperial Brands or any of those big names, uh, this is. This is definitely a huge one, and uh, it, it's no it's no surprise uh, taking into account what uh, what Jules Labs uh, actually produces. It produces e-cigarettes uh, that are essentially uh, vaporizers, and uh, that seems to be that seems to be the um, the format that the smoking format uh, product format that's becoming uh, ever more ever more dominant in uh in developed markets um it was when i was when i was researching uh the uh, the consumers uh, the consumer uh, space for this year's article i was uh i was a bit a bit surprised to find out that uh even though um smoking does seem to be um uh, does seem to be decreasing and does seem to be um socially frowned upon in in developed markets like the us or or europe for the most part as well and even some places like japan um there there's definitely a rise in demand for for tobacco products uh in some emerging markets for example like indonesia um from from and from which markets uh some of the big tobacco companies uh are 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 reaping handsome rather handsome profits at, at the moment so uh it's important to uh to just I, I believe it's just important to recognize uh the the uh the weight of those emerging markets uh for for certain sectors uh like tobacco in this case which is not something immediately immediately obvious to uh to consumers and to just people from uh from developed uh, developed countries um some of the other deals the uh local services merged um m merged company elimi kube uh, got four billion uh four billion dollars the equivalent of four billion dollars backing from alibaba and financial and softbank um singapore based um e-retailer um lazada raised uh two billion dollars from alibaba um, the short uh, video producer New TV uh, raised one billion one billion dollars from uh, some consumer corporates like Alibaba, among many many other media corporates like 21st Century Fox, uh, Liberty Global, NBC Universal, Walt Disney, Warner Media, and so on. Uh, and also worth mentioning are the um, the e-commerce platform uh, Tokopedia. Which is an Indonesian-based e-commerce uh, platform, actually favoring small consumers setting up their uh, their accounts as small retailers rather than favoring wholesalers in there. And uh, and Gojek, which is a which is a uh, right uh, right hailing on-demand service, also based in Indonesia, raised one billion. One billion dollars. Uh, Swiggy, as I mentioned, a, a big food delivery uh, service company in India, also raised a billion dollar a billion dollar round. So quite a few billion dollar rounds uh, uh, in the past in the past year, as you can see. I'm not going to go into detail on the rest of the deals. Uh, you can read uh, you can read more about each and every one of these uh, in the April issue of our magazine. Okay. Um, yeah. No, note in the time. I know we've got the exits. Uh, perhaps we can miss out the university and government slides and sort of do a quick rattle up. We've got some questions right. as well, so we can keep it to the hour mark as well. But just All right. Uh, okay. So very briefly, um, in terms of exits, we saw 30 exits for consumer investors last year, including 14 acquisitions, 13 IPOs. Um, on a year-on-year -year basis, there were 33 exits in uh, 2018, only four so far in uh, 2019. Um, also, uh, 
big uh, big uh, increase from uh, eight eight billion in 2017 to uh, over 12 billion uh, last year. So that's uh, noteworthy in terms of the funding initiatives. Uh, as you know, we uh, try to track funding initiatives, which include. Um, newly launched CVC units, uh, VC funds with uh, corporate LPs, uh, corporate back accelerators and incubators. So we see, we saw that there was a drop uh, in, com uh, in 2018 in comparison with the previous year. Um, in 2018, we saw 36, uh, 36 such initiatives down from 46 the previous year and a corresponding drop in the, uh, in the dollar figures. And with, uh, and with that, I'm actually going to uh, conclude my part of the presentation in order uh, for us to have time for the uh, Q&A. Perfect. Well, thanks for that, Kalyan. And obviously, let me add my thanks again to you, Maisie, for some of those insights and particularly the views. Uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in, but I'll take the liberty of asking the first one, which is, with your title, with what AB InBev is trying to do, how important is the sustainability you described earlier about sort of use drains maybe rather than just using it feedstock you know thinking about how it might become a, a product for consumers itself you talked obviously about sort of water and the agritech space you know is this a kind of strategic you know initiative that AB is trying to do to say we want to get more sustainable and we think the accelerator and the investments will help us do it so it's part of a, a cultural change and transformation to make sure the company is relevant for the future or is it uh, you know something which is a bit more aside from what the main parent is doing you know as an interesting area what you know, talk a little bit about what the strategic sort of relevance for what you do is and you know how you approach the impact or sustainability uh, world yourself Maisie. Sure. So I would say it's it's part of a cultural change for the company. The the sustainability initiative is being led by our chief procurement officer, uh, Tony Milliken. So he's now the chief procurement and sustainability officer for the company. And um, while some products, you know, are where they're manufactured and made and where they source their materials, don't necessarily have a direct impact on the communities, um, ours does. So, you know, beer is made from natural ingredients, it's coming from, um, you know, from agriculture, from these communities, and we're, you know, producing the beer in a community and, and oftentimes even selling back to the communities. And so you need robust um, ecosystems and, and communities and, and operating and sustainable practices to set up the business uh, for long-term growth and, and success and sustained growth. Um, and so that's part of, of why we are putting sustainability uh, at the forefront of this business and making these public commitments um, to achieving our 2025 sustainability goals um, around agriculture, water packaging, and, and energy slash carbon footprint. Um, so that's really, I think, the the reason behind it is making sure that we're setting up the country, the company for the next 100 plus years of growth by investing in the communities where we're operating and making sure that we're practicing, um, you know, sustainable manufacturing, sourcing, et cetera. Um, and along with that, you need to find some of these new solutions to help achieve those goals. And so we reached out to the external market to, to source some of that. And I think, I remember there was a report last year that came out that uh, agrotech was um, the most underrated uh, sector in DC, um, but it's something that we're looking at very aggressively um, to, to different solutions that can help our farmers, that will improve yield, that will um, identify pests and diseases, um, you know, different weather technologies we're looking at in, in certain climates. Um, we're looking at one of the, the companies that we're working with right now that we just won a Fast Company Award for our work with is called BankQ, which is a blockchain solution that's um, show, giving us supply, cha supply, train, supply chain transparency all the way down to our farmers, our direct farmers who are able to make um, a, a ledger of all of their uh, business transactions with us and then take it to a bank to become part of the modern financial infrastructure um, and accessing crop loans and insurance 
even you know basic savings accounts. Um, and so, you know, just an example of a, a sector that we, that you know VCs will invest in that is also really important for corporates. We're looking at really aggressively. We're seeing a lot more solutions coming out of agrotech um, and for that space specifically. Uh, and so you're going to see a nice, I think, collaboration between you know this the venture community and corporate ventures in investing in those, and then the corporates in in scaling those within their own supply chains. Mm, fascinating. It seems a really interesting initiative. Thanks, Maisie. Um, question from Rob Rosenberg. Um, is there any evidence that as millennials age, their buying habits revert to big brands and brick and mortar retailers? So I, I think that, um, it, you know, certainly when when people have children, their buying patterns change. Um, that's pretty well known. So I think as millennials continue, you know, are, are having kids, it'll be interesting to see if that if that trend continues that they go to a big box because it's easy and convenient and, and less expensive. Um, I think that, you know, we're, we're certainly seeing kind of a, a continued growth and concentration on, you know, sustainable companies, sustainable solutions. Um, it's, I, I was talking to someone this morning who was saying that, you know, she's in her late thirties and it, you know, it, institutional investors who are courting people like her, that, that sector, um, are changing their investment structures because these millennials are continuing to demand, uh, that there are ESGs in their portfolio, um, that their companies have, you know, sustainable goals, sustainable practices. And that's something that's at the forefront of um, of their investment strategy, and so I think that millennials will. You know, what I'm seeing right now is that they're continuing that trend. They're demanding that those types of companies and solutions be part of these larger portfolios, and so I think that at least I can at least speak to that. That we're going to I think continue to see that, and it's going to grow. Um, and institutional investors and VCs. Um, who have LPs who are demanding these types of uh, products be part of their portfolio are going to force the trend to continue. Mm. Interesting, interesting. And then perhaps it kind of relates back to the first one, another question coming in, which is, in what ways are consumer corporates getting strategic value from their CBC activities? You know, is there anything sort of, you know, from an AB InBev point of view, you can point to it and say, yeah, that's, you know, it's part of the cultural change, but this is strategically important, you know, that we're on the right side and, and here's the early evidence for it. Sorry, did, one more time. So the question um, is... Are consumer corporates getting strategic value from their CBC activities? Is there anything that, for example, you could point to as a, you know, example or demonstration? Um, I think that at least initially you get a lot of you know learnings um, from your investment so one of the companies that that we've invested in from the zx ventures portfolio is a company called swish um, and it's the parent company to um, babe the the canned wine products that the that an influencer um, called the fat jewish has created so it's canned wine um, wine in alternative formats. Um, and it's uh, the first time where it's really an influencer led brand that we have in our portfolio. And so it's it's definitely pushing, um, pushing us outside of our comfort zone, I would say, um, and, and making us learn about how consumers are interacting with influencers, how that type of direct response um, marketing and um, you know, direct buying even through these social media platforms because you can do that um, for for wine. So you can buy direct. You know, the, the, this influencer does a post about the wine, um, and and consumers can buy directly through Instagram. That's a completely new uh, channel for us. It's a, a new you know marketing way of marketing to consumers, interacting with them, um, and so I think. You know, and that that brand is is growing nicely, and so I think that it, that's at least one example of 
the the corporate venture um, arm making an investment in a completely new type of business that is helping the you know the, the parent really understand new buying patterns and trends um, and and thinking about how we can uh, implement that into our other brands and 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 channels and marketing initiatives. So I would say that may be the, the most relevant uh, example that we have in our portfolio. Fascinating. It's a great name. Something sticks in the mind, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, Kelly, I'm mindful of time. Um, so you know, a lot of people try and stop yeah, us. Sort of I would, the hour mark, I would like one for yourself. And, and... Yeah, I would like to ask Maisie just one more question um, because uh, the corporate venturing space is still a very much uh, male dominated space and it's not often that we um, we have a female uh, leading a CVC uh, on our webinar. So I would like to ask her, um, what is the kind of advice that you would give to uh, young women uh, looking to uh, start a career in, uh, in venturing and in corporate venturing uh, in particular? Interesting question. So I think that um, my initial response would be, uh, and I and I'm speaking basic, just from my own experience, is that you know as women are earning more, um, you know purchasing more, and and setting some of these trends, it's increasingly important for all of these corporates to understand their consumer. Um, or their new consumers, and and we, mm -hmm. and Bever, are certainly looking at women. How do we um, produce products that are going to uh, you know, benefit women? That will be um, interesting and um, enticing for women. And I and if you have only um, men on your CDC who are looking to the next generation of products, um, you're really going to miss. And so I think that. Right. Uh, having you know it's, it's a huge asset to have women on your team who you know understand the market they can speak to their own experience and purchase patterns and what their friends are buying and finding important um, and they can help set the strategy for what the companies can be doing to address uh, you know th these you know these 50 percent of consumers um, that they that they may or may not be right now and so um, having good perspective on what those products are going to be, what those trends are going to be, um, having hypotheses is going to be a differentiator for women because these companies need to be addressing women, you know, need to be thinking about need states and occasions and all sorts of, of different products for them. And um, if you have a really good pulse on what your peers are buying and, and what they're looking to in the future and how those ecosystems are operating, I think it's a big differentiator as you're going into CDC and investing and looking at that gen next generation of products um, that can be huge growth engines for these corporates. Right. Thank you very much for for this uh, for this insightful uh, look on things, and not only on the uh, women issue, but on on everything you you just shared with us uh, on this webinar. Um, it's uh, it's been very very helpful, very interesting to learn things uh, from a practitioner as as always. Uh, thank you very much for uh, participating, um, Jim. Any any final words? No, I have my thanks, but thanks to you, Kalyan, for setting up and organising this, and as ever, preparing the data. It's really much appreciated and, and very in, insightful. So thanks very much, and look forward to the next one. Absolutely, and um, thanks uh, to all people who uh, managed to attend uh, uh, this live. Uh, for those who uh, who didn't, you will receive uh, you they will receive uh, a copy of both the slides and the uh, video recording. Stay tuned for our, our next webinar, uh, which is going to take place sometime in the second second week of May, right before our symposium. And, um, and uh, have a good uh, day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Goodbye. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Galian. Bye. Bye now.